Welcome. In this episode, we are joined by Dr. Lucas Ovagno, Associate Professor at Bilken University, to talk about cities in Byzantium. Hello, Luca. Welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure being here, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for accepting our invitation. It's really good uh, to have you here. Uh, before, you know, starting with the conversation, why don't you say a few things about yourself uh, so our audience gets to know you? Yeah, I'm, I'm with pleasure. I'm currently an associate professor in Byzantine studies at Bilkent University in Ankara, but my journey started from an uh, academic journey. started from, uh, from Venice, Italy, uh, where I got my BA, and then uh, I moved for my PhD, MPhil first and PhD. Back then you could still upgrade. Uh, it was the days when you could upgrade from, from MPhil to PhD at the University of Birmingham, uh, Center of Byzantine Ottoman and Modern Greek Studies, where I, um, where I pursue my PhD on, uh, and the topic was Byzantine cities with uh, under the supervision of Chris Wickham and uh, John Holden. And then when John Holden moved to Princeton the last year of uh, my PhD with um, with um, Richard White. Uh, and this is the link that we have with 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 Gavril. So it's the link with them. Um, it's the Birmingham, infamous Birmingham connection, if you allow me to yeah. say. <laughs> Just uh... Indeed, yes. And then uh, after my PhD, I moved to Istanbul, where I got my postdoc at Danamed. And that's where my uh, Love story with Turkey, <laughs> or with the, of this of the Eastern Mediterranean, better started, because immediately after that I got my first uh, position at uh, Eastern Mediterranean University in uh, in Cyprus, Northern Cyprus, actually, and from there in uh, uh, in Ankara to the, in Bilkent. So that's my my journey in a sense, which I mean I hope it will continue, but <laughs> for the time being. He stopped at uh, Bilkent in Ankara. But, you know, I was wondering, and uh, Mr. Panos uh, was wondering that too, uh, why and how did you decide to, you know, start working on cities? Well, there is one thing that I always said. I mean, I'm sure you agree, guys. I mean, because in the end, I mean, I'm young enough. It doesn't look like, thank God they don't see it <laughs> uh, on the podcast. They don't see the video. But I'm young enough to remember, I mean, the, 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 the days when I was when I was a student. And I think uh, we were chatting with, with you guys before a bit. Uh, it's about the passion and the, uh, and the influence because of the passion that the, the instructors have. So uh, when I was doing my BA in... Um, in Venice, at the University of Venice, Ca Foscari, uh, the first course I took was Byzantine history. And then I took Byzantine, because I, I really like uh, the way that uh, the professor back then, it was Professor Giorgio Ravignani, who is a, was a leading figure in Byzantine uh, studies in uh, in Italy, the way he talk, uh, the way he taught pardon, uh, Byzantine history. Then I took Byzantine art history and the, as, a, as a course, so one th- one thing led to another. And in the Byzantine art history, uh, during that course, uh, this professor, uh, I mean, the, 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 the professor uh, in charge, Professor Anio Concina, was also start running an excavation in, um, in, the, um, in, the, uh, in, a, in an area, in a city, pardon, called Kivitas Novera Cliana, which was a Byzantine found, I mean, uh, completely newly founded city dated to the seventh century, obviously dedicated to Emperor Heraclius. And there is a lot of connections with the origins of Venice, because nowadays this, this city, which is buried uh, and hasn't been fully excavated, it would never be most probably fully excavated, is on the, on the countryside, not far away from Venice, something like 30 kilometers as the, fro- the crow flies. Um, but uh, back in the day, back in the seventh century, was uh, really in the lagoon. So basically, it was a Venice before Venice, in a sense, up to a point. 
So he was trying to run an excavation then, and he brought us there to, to help him with the excavation. I mean, he set up a team and a lab to study the material which came up from this very, very small trench that he excavated, to be honest. I remember it was extremely, extremely, extremely small. And I mean, we start, I start studying, I mean, I mean, I start getting interested into the, the city, the, the way that a new city was born, it was founded, and so on and so forth. Then and then I decided to continue study with, with him uh, under his supervision, in a sense. I in Italy. It's a, a little bit different uh, than in uh, in the UK or elsewhere. I think it's a little bit similar to what uh, the, 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 the university system in Greece, where you can, in the end, at the end of your uh, of your studies, you can ask. Right? I think Panos can confirm that you can ask for a professor to supervise a BA, what is called BA thesis, in a sense. And which is propedeutic to the master and then to the PhD later on, obviously, with the master. So I asked if I could write a thesis on cities and on Byzantine cities. So he said, um, under his supervision, in light of the fact that we were excavating a Byzantine cities, a Byzantine city, pardon. And he said, yes. So he encouraged me to continue working on cities. So I remember that the BA thesis was about, um, was a comparison between Kivitas um, Nova Nacleana, obviously, Nafplion in Greece. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, what was the third one now? I forgot about it. I, I thought it was a master's in, uh, in, uh, in Anatolia. Well, in the end, the thesis turned into an SOP for, uh, for the MPhil at the University of Birmingham, uh, where Chris Wickham, uh, where Professor Wickham was happy to, 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 in a sense, embrace or help me developing this uh, first idea stemming from my thesis. And basically once I got in Birmingham through Chris was, I mean, a courtesy of Chris and also of John Holden, who were both having cities at the, the, the heart uh, of their research, both of them. I mean, uh, it was the, I mean, I went, I arrived in Birmingham when, uh, when Chris was writing, framing the early middle ages and John was completing the first volume or sparkly starting, pardon, the first volume uh, of the Iconoclasm uh, books, the sources one, the one on sources. But uh, John had worked on cities before with Byzantium in the seventh century and so on and so forth. So that's how we, that's how I came to city. And it boils down in the end, it boils down to, to teachers, right? And what they do and the passion that they have is they transmit that passion if they make you part of something or make you feel part of something. I mean, the excavation back then, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much, you know, but that I remember that excavation back then. I mean, it was like to us, I mean, there was a group of students, not basically none of them continued and they you know, went on. But for us, it was like really, we felt like Indiana Jones discovering the origins of Venice. So, I mean, it was like, oh, my God. And, and, and the prof, and, and Professor Conchino passed away later on. Was happy also to encourage us to encourage this kind of enthusiasm with the lab and everything. So it was, was, was good, good days. Good days. So in order to understand the how a city was founded and maybe the motives or the ideology behind the creation of a city, uh, can we talk about uh, the difference, maybe, between Roman time or Byzantine time, if there is any? Yeah, that's 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 a very good question. I mean, it it there is obviously uh, a difference, and I think starting this journey from a newly founded city, in a sense, helped a lot. Because when I studied Kivitas Nova Racleana, which also, by the way, was included in the PhD thesis, uh, I managed to have it as an appendix because it didn't, it could, I mean, there was a word limitation, I don't remember. We had to add it as an appendix or something like that um, in the end. Um, having, starting from, a, as I said, this journey from a completely uh, founded from scratch, newly found city, which was also the capital of the Venice Ducate, okay, the Byzantine Venice Ducate. I mean, the story of the uh, Byzantine Venice Ducate is pretty famous. Okay, it took off in the with the with the arrival of the Lombards and the separation of uh, the Venezia. That was the 
the name of the region, actually the Venezia, because it was already plural, the, 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 the clear separation of the Venezia Maritima, the maritime Venice, from the Venezia Terrestris, from the terrestrial Venice, in a sense. The former under control of the Byzantines and the second under control of the Lombards and later on part of the Kingdom of Italy and so on and so forth, so completely different trajectories between the two areas. The Venezia Maritima, obviously, the lagoon, the lagoon, okay, uh, which were more extended than they are today, but more or less this is the is the landscape that we are uh, we were facing. Well, in the Venezia Maritima, at some point, Byzantium decided to found a new city in, called Civitas Nova Eracleana. I mean, is also his origins trajectories are a little bit uh, how can I say uh, shroud uh, shrouded in uh, in myth, because then Venice when they Venice built its own uh, the myth as a city, because I mean, this is what also city do. They like to 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 dress up, okay, to use myths to change their their past, to mold to mold their past, and to recreate their own past. Anyway, uh, when when we are dealing with this new city, and I mean, completely found from scratch in the middle of a lagoon. I mean, you are dealing with an urban fabric and landscape, which has nothing to do with was supposedly or could be there in the past. And they are, I mean, I'm referring to, or I can quote, I can cite a book, which is, I think, a wonderful book called, uh, by edited by Suna Kabatai and a few other colleague, colleagues, uh, called a cities as, City as Palimpsest. So this idea that city are, right, um, sort of uh, accumulation of uh, layers I mean, obviously having to do with, and I'm, I will return to that maybe later on, to function, to fabric, to landscape, to uh, to myth, to memories, and so on and so forth. Well, in this very case, you don't have any palaces. There was uh, clearly something that uh, it was virgin territory and they built the city. So that helps you a lot to, to try and understand and to try to come to grasp with the fact that this concept that... Uh, you need necessarily a predecessor of a city to to have uh, a city itself could be deceiving sometimes. So, I mean, Panos, you are sitting in Thessaloniki. I mean, Gavrili is sitting in Liverpool. There is not too much we can do with Liverpool. What can we do? But with Thessaloniki, <laughs> which is a great, which is a great city, there you are sitting on a palace as you are on the top of. I mean, you know it better than me. I don't need to teach you anything. But there, when starting from scratch, you can fully. Uh, grasp the the, the 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 fact that a city the, the the term city i think doesn't mean anything in a sense we take it many so many things for granted because i mean we think that the city should mean something or we in, with our in our mind it meant something and we are all you and i mean all of us uh in a sense influenced by all well, the policies right the police it's the foundation uh of Western civilization, or one the foundation of Western civilization, with all the amenities that the police has. I mean, I don't need to to list them. But here, I mean, you have something completely new, something completely different, a different way of even conceiving a city, of thinking of a city, which in a sense forces you to, as I was mentioning before, to deal with functions more than anything. So this idea that you are having a city to satisfy certain functions and satisfy them in a way that most probably, actually, for certain, for for sure, certainly, in the past would have sat be satisfied and would have been um, um, materialized in a sense. Literally, I'm using materialized or make cre. I mean, made them uh, real, made them uh, made up with. I mean, with matter in a sense, in a completely different way. So, for instance, in Kivitas Novaracriana, I mean, there is no, there was no, uh, no stone being used. I mean, you are something that later on, um, Sauro Geliki uh, and Andrea Ugenti, among the others, have identified happening through excavation, through archaeology, in a place called Comacchio, which is another ancestor of Venice, in the, which basically flourished in the 8th and 9th century, again, in the middle of the lagoon, taking advantage of the fact that Ravenna had fallen, 
and these places completely built along the lines of uh, north of northern Emporia, places like Hamwick, places like uh, Quentovic, places like like uh, London and so on and so forth, many others. Uh, so with Kivitas Novaraklane, you see uh, these residential areas being built, or most probably being built with uh, in wood. Okay, there is there are no stones. There is, because in the lagoons there are no stones, and if you, if I mean, I'm, I'm referring here to the to a ninth century will of a Byzantine, sorry, of a Venetian duke. Duke is a Byzantine title here, clearly. Uh, Justinianus Particiacus, who basically in his will included stones. I said, I'm bequating stones. If you bequate stones, it means that stones are not really uh, so so common to be found. So you have to to deal, to satisfy a certain function in a different way. And there you have, is Kivitas Novarakani, you, you had a mound, which had, which most probably, actually not most probably, it had a church and a baptistery, which was the only, most probably one of the few buildings built entirely with stones. And obviously there you have all the, the idea of exalting certain functions, the, the place of, of the bishop, the place of the, the first Duke, because that was the capital of the Venezia Maritima, the first capital, followed by Metamalcum and then Riyadh. So, in a nutshell, sorry, I, I, I talk once again too much. You are forced to face uh, the reality of a city. And here, I think Nico Civic is, is absolutely right. The reality, what a real Byzantine city is or was, in a sense, or one of the possible realities of Byzantine city. I hope I answer, Panos. If not... <laughs> no, no, that's fine. But I have uh, so many questions. One of, one of them has uh, to do with Saloniki and, uh, and the relationship with Constantinople. And um, in your book, uh, you characterize them as red queens. So I have the opportunity to ask why this terminology and maybe uh, we can talk about the relationship the special relationship between these two major cities in eastern mediterranean once again it's a great question i mean and you you how can i say you <laughs> you stress the fact that in my in my books also in the previous one on cyprus i always i like to to refer to my questionable and very bad taste in uh, cinema, in these many cases, obviously Resident Evil. But I, I, I always, I mean, I like cinema. I happen to to teach also. I mean, the things that you do for 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 a living. Uh, I was asked to teach uh, history of, uh, of cinema when I was in uh, teaching in uh, Northern Cyprus. So I I did it with. I mean, I always like movies, and I mean, but I like this kind of pop culture in a sense. So the Red Queens is obviously, as I said, a, ref a reference to Resident Evil in previous, I mean, I have to tell to, to your audience that in previous articles and previous books, I made, I refer to way better movies, like uh, one recent article is called Cyprus and its Sister, really I mean, referring to a movie of Woody Allen, so it's much better. But this one, the Red Queens is uh, Resident Evil because, I mean, I was playing and I was toying with this um uh, with this source, Western source, um, which refer to the, um, the cities in the West, okay, as uh, as uh, cadavers, as corpses, in a sense, okay, because I mean, the Western Roman Empire fell, and uh, it was um, the cities were. Uh, completely destroyed. So this course, corpses, this idea that cities turn into zombies, like in Resident Evil, right? And the only ones to survive were the Red Queen, in the Red Queens, plural in this very case, and not singular like in the movie, uh, is something that we need to overcome in a sense. So this idea that the only, and I'm going back to to to, you know, to Tsibiki's article here, the idea of having simply uh, Constantinople or Thessaloniki as the Byzantine cities par excellence, and the others are basically corpses that from turn move from Polis to Castron. I mean, most probably return to this, and they shrank, they lost importance, they lost, uh, they depopulated, they simply shelter behind hastily built uh, fortification and so on and so forth. Well, this idea should be challenged in a sense. 
it's true that, as you were mentioning, the link, I mean, the role of Constantinople as a capital and the role of Thessaloniki as the second city, the most important in the Aegean, the one which survived um, uh, to the to the Slavic, Avar and Slavic incursion, the one which developed the, the, the cult of San Dimitrios, um, and so on and so forth. These two have caught a lot of attention. I'm not saying that this is wrong, but uh, and is but it's also deceiving because we may tend to believe that this is what is left of, of the of or, or what should really uh, get our attention in archaeological terms. Well, it's also true that they produce a lot of literary sources, which in particular in the seventh and eighth century we don't have. The miracle of San Demetrius is one. Of, one of the of the sources in question, but this once again, if we think only of the Red Queens, I mean, you tend to believe that Byzantium had turned into that sort of last uh, those two city, but the last redact of urbanism, and this is not the case. Uh, so my idea was to encourage to look beyond the this idea that these two cities, which best I mean, think represent the most important ones, were all the only. Uh, representative of Byzantine urbanism or what we can call Byzantine urbanism and we should instead try to have a look at what's going on elsewhere and even challenge certain preconception uh, which those city help us to, to fool in a sense because if you think uh, of how cities were represented I mean if you think you know this thing way better than me and I'm sure the audience is way way familiar with this mosaic 10th century in the south vestibule of Hagia Sophia right Constantine donating or uh, showing or uh, asking the Theotokos for uh, protection to the city. The city is represented like, like a wall-led uh, model. That's it, the walls and the Halki, right? Uh, represent the city, the gate, strong gates, bronze gates, and so on and so forth. If it's not the Halki, it's the golden gate. Change. Uh, it doesn't change too much. Uh, at least not in uh, iconographic terms, maybe in ideological terms, yes. Well, anyway, uh, also this idea that, and those cities had huge fortification, like Thessaloniki, Panos, uh, you know this better than me, and Constantinople, uh, Gabriel most probably also know, I mean, these are huge fortifications, but, but those fortifications we tend to identify simply as a structure, infrastructure which protects the city, I mean, at different meanings. Once again, the palaces, right? The palaces of meanings, the palaces of uh, function, connotation, the way that, the, the, and this is another thing that I'm always encouraging. I would like to see more, much more study, the history from below, the way that the, and this is Nikos Bakirtis has done a wonderful job on uh, the fortification of Thessaloniki in this respect, exactly. The way that you see the fortification, the population interacting with the fortification and not simply as, okay, they are protecting us and this is true, but also a way, for instance, and Nikos has showed us the continuity of this function even in today, in today's world, a way to, uh, to advertise certain uh, aspect of the city life, being that more obviously restoration, but also other uh, events which or which I mean uh, dotted punctuated the city life or uh, a way to exalt to as I was saying before right to give importance uh, visually and practically to certain areas or structures certain functions of the city. I think Christina Sikonakis did a wonderful job in showing this for in a place called Elefterna in Crete where basically you have these huge walls built in the late 7th century. And well, but those walls, yes, have a lot, I mean, protection for sure, nobody's toning it down, but it's also, it also has a lot to do with that area of the city, which was included or encased by the walls. And there's a lot to do with the fact that that area was the place where the local bishop and the local Administra administrators, the aristocrats, the elites, uh, imperial or not, uh, resided. And therefore, it's more, more to do about controlling the population that live outside the walls rather than protecting themselves from sort of invasions, because that's also another myth, right? That's why the Red Queens, in a sense, we are sheltering from 
an, an invasion of zombies. Those zombies could be the Arabs, could be the Avar Slavs in the case of Thessaloniki. That's another layer, metaphorical layer that I would like to hint at. And that's uh, why, in a sense, the Red, the red Queens and I guess not only the people we protect, not only the the city, not only from the people um, who live outside of it, but also from the people who cultivate the land, I guess, based on a feudalism um, system of uh, the medieval world, right? Well, you know better than me, Gabriel, that fails. If, I, if we utter feudalism immediately, we get 3,600 eats on the part of the others. What the heck are you... Feudalism in Byzantium, I mean, uh, but uh, is this is this is a very good, I mean, a very good point because if you look at the city as Justiniana Prima, you see this thing in action. Sorry, being this kind of way of devising or a way of uh, building a certain. Uh, urban environment, urban landscape, urban uh, uh, fabric, if you want, with zo- what's called a zoning, right? If you have Jutiniana Prima in mind, uh, the, the map, the plan, you have an area, uh, once again, encased by walls with this forum uh, of uh, circular, like in Constantinople, right? In Constantine Forum, you have the two, uh, the two, uh, portico streets intersecting exactly at the at the at the forum, the circular forum. You have the basilica, you have the palace of the local of the prefect, if I'm not mistaken. Then as a first line of walls separating this area from the lower city, and then you had another part of the city which was dedicated with uh, the second part as a residential function with uh with um, with other churches basilicas and so on and so forth other amenities and then you have a third part of the city where you have commercial artisanal quarters and even part of the city which is uh which as you said uh and the chora in a sense right the whole uh the countryside uh and this is another this is a very good way of interpreting the city i think it's essential to see the city as a combination of the two in a sense, nothing new under the sun, right? But we tend to think, ah, okay, everything is happening behind closed, <laughs> behind the walls, behind the closed doors. Uh, and the rest of the city is purely, I mean, either residential or if we are lucky uh, with artisanal and commercial functions. And so purely parasitical up to a point uh, or partially productive sometimes. But I mean, that's pretty much it. We don't have too much going on. I mean, this interaction between the city and uh, and uh, the, the countryside is essential and should be taken into due consideration. Okay. Uh, I mean, true, those walls could act as a shelter for those peasants who were running away from the countryside if something happened. Uh, so there is the for I mean the for, the, 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 the kind of protective uh, thing, but it is also meant they are also meant to keep those peasants away when there is something going on and they are. Not very happy let's say, with uh, the uh, with the 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 the, the, um, the, 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 the sorry the the taxation the level of taxation that's what I was looking for and uh, and the fiscal uh, pressure or if there is something something going on so there are tons of references to this to the very fact that life in the city. Uh, was happening outside the walls. That things were happening outside, uh, outside the walls. So you have to take both of them into into consider into consideration. I think, well, we'll most probably return to that later on. But I think one of the best examples of this is the city of Gortin in Crete where Enrico Zanini, as among the others, Elisabetta Giorgi as well, have investigated the city, its trajectories, its development, the development of the urban structures, but above all the infrastructures. But the way they look at the urban infrastructures, which is once again functional and having to do with the relationship between people and the city, 
once again, the reality of the city, I think, is absolutely crucial. Uh, and here I'm paying homage to Nico Sevisky once again, to look at the reality of the city, not only in terms of, well, we move away from Constantinople and Thessalonica because we were not Thessaloniki because we were not the only one, but also because, I mean, the reality of, of the urban life in Byzantium has to do with the people living in the city. So Elisabetta Georgian uh, in particular has investigated the, um, the flow of the Gortinian waters. So I'm, I'm, and then when I'm talking about Gortin, I'm always mentioning, uh, deliberately making this example, I think it's also in the book, talking about the overflowing life. So it's using this metaphor of water and encouraging people to see how the, the life overflow the, the walls. I mean, went beyond the walls because the the, the, the investigation of the uh, water supply uh, infrastructure in Gortin has shown and through the development of this from a proper aqueduct to a series of fountains and cisterns, 6th to 7th and partially 8th century even. I mean, I show how basically people, I mean, uh, interacted and people uh, lived the city, and you can see how you move from uh, line, uh, 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 pipeline branching out to a foci of settlement center around cisterns and and uh, fountains, which can tell you a lot about the social uh, profile, socioeconomic profile of the city, because you mean most probably the control of those fountains and cisterns has a lot to do with local. Um, foci once again of settlements which revolved around maybe uh, ecclesiastical uh, authorities or simply local elites and so there there you go you have a, a kind of city I mean and also toying with this idea city of islands not because Cretan Cortin is in Crete on an island not simply because that but because you have this idea of different uh, different uh, areas of settlement and by investigating, sorry, I'm continuing by investigating the flow of Gortinian waters, they realized that um, by calculating, made the calculation of how much water was actually used by the population and how much water was instead uh, then uh, let reach the countryside, the very rich countryside around it, you see how much I mean, it's way more water it was um, Cap, um, captured from the sources which were 25 kilometers away if I'm not mistaken from Gortin brought to the city obviously used to quench the thirst of the of the Gortinians and then but a large amount of it was then I mean flew through the city into the countryside which clearly fed and there you don't even have walls the only walls you can find in Gortin is once again uh, seven, second half of the seventh century, most pro probably, uh, mm -hmm. crowning the Acropolis. But you had several foci of settlements, which are documented by geographies, even and by archaeology, obviously being built in the even in the early eight, in the first half part of the eighth century. And well, those areas were fed by these uh, by systems by. Uh, by fountains and but that water then was I mean flow into the countryside and you'd have no wall separating those Fokayo settlements from the countryside so there is a strict interaction there and I'm lucky enough and sorry this is the very last point then you can cut me off and I'm lucky enough to live in a city which surprised me in this respect because I mean before coming to to, to Ankara where I live right now I well, I live in uh, in Istanbul. I'm a med. I told you before, and Istanbul very dense. It's like Thessaloniki, Panos, more or less, or like Liverpool, guys. Yeah, the same Birmingham. Okay, occasionally you can have a couple of parks in Birmingham, a golf <laughs> club, but here in Ankara is very peculiar because Ankara developed. I mean, it was a an artificial capital, okay, once again, in the same line, in, in a little bit, in a sense, with Kivitas Novaraklian. It was an art it's artificial capital, you know better than me, created in 1920, after the after the, the war, uh, and after the establishment of the Turkish Republic in 1923. So it developed from the, the area around the castle, which is the Byzantine castle, actually, which later on had uh, Ottoman, an Ottoman phase, and so on and so forth. So it developed from, from that area 
it slowly with the with the with the migration of people who reach the capital, the embassies, and so on and so forth, and with the latest real estate developments. Well, anyway, developed it turned into a city of six million people. So we are, but it's nothing like uh, Istanbul. There is no, I mean, there are areas which were densely built, and then there are, there are areas which have it's forest. I mean, there are not parks like Birmingham, something that has been. Uh, constructed in a sense. These are really forests which have been kept by large areas. I mean, one is the campus of the Middle East Technical University. If you uh, go, zoom it through Google Earth, you see it's a huge, it's a vast, enormous, humongous area which separates a quarter of a city from another quarter. So it's, once again, the forest in this very case, but we are not talking about uh, uh, the countryside, which is um, cultivated in a sense or used in any possible way, simply a huge chunk of forest, but there are others, it is not only this one. And so there is kind of this interaction between what we could have called as a countryside and uh, what we can call uh, a city. So Ankara in this respect makes you think a lot of this kind of development, which we could, this interaction that we could we could document. Then you can have the Eric Ivison, and this is the, uh, the very, last, very, very last point. Sorry, sorry. Um, Eric Ivison, who can, in, going back to Gortin, who can tell you, well, there are city of islands because, I mean, we excavated only those islands, and in between there is nothing. That's a good point, but I still, I mean, tend to believe that that model uh, still uh, old uh, truth, even if, I mean, in in, uh, in other cities, it may not fully apply. In Thessaloniki, it doesn't apply. Uh, for instance, the city of Ireland model, or up to a point, maybe yes, later on. But, I mean, that's a good caveat and a good objection that we also have to keep in mind. Look, I need to ask you something which... Uh, which is personal, I mean, I know. But we, <laughs> it, it cannot, we cannot go there. It Thanos, is personal, I mean, you say know? something. I thought we said before we cannot go there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is personal. Actually, this question, it is, you know, um, it's personal because it has to do partially with my uh, doctor uh, research. So we have the provinces, we have the capital, we have big cities. In the historiography, the historiographical sources, we have quite interesting opinions of how it is to live in a province, in a city in a province. We have seen very weird descriptions of how, is, uh, how it feels to live in Athens or in other, in other um, provincial uh, cities or towns. My question now is... What do we know about the relations between the big provincial cities and Constantinople? Obviously, especially before the 9th century, we have nice examples uh, which are not indicative of the true relations. Um, for example, I have uh, Kherson in my mind. And what is the role of the elite, of the provincial elite in these relations, especially in the 9th century and after the 9th century, when we have a new, a kind of new elite coming up? That's a very good question and not easy, not easy to answer. I mean, the focus, okay, let me put it this way. The focus of the Byzantine Empire, I think, became much more the Aegean in a sense, because the loss of Sicily, the loss of Sicily, pardon, on the one hand, uh, brought, okay, other provinces may have stayed. I mean, Sardinia may have been part of this Byzantine Kine, Dalmatia as well, a little bit. Uh, the Balearics most probably were lost forever in the beginning of the 10th century. So you have uh, the role of the Aegean in economic terms became prevalent, became predominant in a sense. I mean, in ways that most probably it wasn't there before or to the fullest, I'm thinking of the trunk route that Michael McCormick has several times uh, stressed, uh, the existence of which part of several stress linking the Tyrrhenian with the Aegean. Now it's much more uh, Aegean uh, oriented. Okay, Crete was lost, but then it was recovered in the mid of the 10th century, same for Cyprus. Um, so in this respect, and you mentioned Kherson, which is, True, but it's a, it's a place where 
And I think Florin Kurta was mentioning this in a recent in a recent online lecture of his. Something's not fully clear going on because you have Arjontes there, right? In uh, in charge of the city, and you don't fully understand uh, how how much um, uh, I mean how that, I mean how much of a of a, how much uh, and the orders if the orders were obviously coming from Constantinople, if they have a, a kind of um, um, leverage in a sense to act as we suspected independently as a sort of uh, not only buffer, but a sort of broker between the steps. And and Byzantium and Kherson was also at some point a mint, if I'm not mistaken. So I think um, in this respect, and you you have you see that in terms of of cities, the AG and taking off, you can think of Thebes, you can think of Corinth, you can think of um, of Athens itself up to a point. Uh, and so on and so forth. You can think of the change. That's very good. Going back to, to Crete, change of the um, settlement pattern in, in in Crete, where you have nothing to do with the Arabs. Something which is already happening before the the Andalusian pirates created or conquered Crete and created the Emirate. The change of the settlement pattern from the southern coast of the island, which used to be very important until the 8th century, to the northern coast of the island, the creation of Iraklian. That's highly indicative of the role of uh, the Aegean as a kind of, uh, as a kind of uh, magnet, in a sense, in econo- as a network. And this is the work, basically, that uh, Chris also has, uh, Chris Wickham has, uh, brought to the attention of the of the public and the Aegean becoming the sort of catalyst of uh, the Byzantine Empire in, fully in the 10th and 11th century. So in this respect, when it comes to elites, uh, is what I, I've tried to also to mention in the book, this kind of uh, development of the local elites, not certainly along the lines that we experience or one can experience in the in the previous centuries, and for instance, a much more, uh, I mean, a developed, uh, the developing of mercantile elites, if you want. I'm thinking once again of the Archontes of Mona Invasia, for instance, another example. Not everywhere, certainly, but uh, Mona Invasia is another example of, of a city uh, in this respect. Uh, Cities which were not, for instance, thematic capital like Ephesus, which developed pilgrimage center, arbors, and this is the work, for instance, of Andreas Kulzer, which and others, which talk about the, the importance, the continuous importance of the Ephesian arbor, arbors, actually plural, even if the the, the Roman arbor silted up, we thought it was the end of the city. That was not the case. It, well, it continued well uh, into the into the 10th and 11th centuries, the work of um, of Sabine Lashtetter as well, and in terms of Arbor and of Andreas Kulzer, among the others. So, commercial elites, the Archontes of Monenvasia, were commercial elites, okay? Uh, very strange one, very peculiar one, but you have... And with uh, through Monenvasia, exactly, this kind of mercantile elites, and I think this is what Jonathan Shea in his thesis, which has unfortunately never been published, uh, as mentioned, I mean, through this you could you can see how Byzantium, I mean, how certain cities of Byzantium could have developed uh, in certain ways. I think is is, is focusing his attention on Monembasia, if I'm not mistaken, Ioannina, Arta, and a fourth one, which now I don't fully. I don't fully recollect, but the the, 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 the the point that Jonathan Shea is making in his thesis is that, uh, and he's using a lot of sigillographic material, this is for you, Gabriel, if you, I mean, I'm sure you know what, but, um, is that those cities could have developed along the lines of Italian mercantile cities, and, uh, and the peculiarity of these Archontes in a, in a, Byzantine Empire, which was Aegean uh, center, but also obviously retaining parts of the of Anatolia, in particular the western uh, part, showed certain peculiarities. Because I remember the 
uh, what are called the Mavromates, if I'm not mistaken, family from Archontes from Monimbasia, who ended up being the one of them being the father-in-law of the Seljuk Sultan and in charge of Nicaea when the Seljuk uh, conquered Nicaea. So you see these once again moving away, way bearing away from Constantinople, which co catches sometimes too much attention or caught the eyes, rightly so in a sense, but in terms of scholarly attention, you see these uh, things going on, these ideas going on. You're absolutely right when you said if you look at the provinces from the uh, from the Constantinople point of view, I think you're. I mean, you were referring to Michael Coniates, right? The, the, exactly. This famous passage on Athens, for instance, is all this is backwards of the empire. This is terrible. What am I living in? I mean, this is there is no class to quote. I think Joe Pesci in another movie. There is no class here. There is no class. Um, but you you see interesting things. Uh, going on, I think certainly in uh, in terms, for instance, of com commercial life and thriving commercial life, and in political terms, because as I said before, these are contests in charge of Monembasia or in charge of Kherson had ways of, I mean, navigating through the have certain abilities, which we can also find, for instance, in Cyprus, tenth century, the Archbishop, I think his name was. Uh, Dimitris, Dimitrios, if I'm not mistaken, who was chosen, is the Archbishop of Cyprus, was chosen as a member of um, of a um, diplomatic embassy to to the Caliph. So you see the abilities of these kind of peripheral elites, you want to call them, uh, being able to navigate it through the interstices of uh, provincial life, which is not necessarily uh, as clear cut as Constantinople wants to see, and uh, this is, as I said before, commercial terms, economic term, political, if you want, with the Mavromatis, mm -hmm. I think. Sorry, my bad. Uh, I will double check. And the Arcontes in uh, in uh, in Kherson, you see this, and this has been an article which has been published, I think, in two thousand and thirteen, something like that, which pushes this thing. A little bit farther, this idea, for instance, of commercial elites, of the role of commercial elites, a little bit farther and straight into the art of Constantinople. I don't remember the author right now. I will tell you later on for sure. But she's interpreting the famous, but, or maybe you are familiar with it. Uh, is, is she's interpreting, is she interpreting the uh, mosaic, the famous mosaic on the um, gallery, in the gallery of Hagia Sophia, the one with Constantine Monomachos, right? And um, Zoe, the princess Zoe, was the Monomachos has a pouch, right, in his hands. And uh, Zoe had uh, uh, the scroll, which traditionally has been interpreted as a donation to the church and so on and so forth. Well, it's provocative and is highly debatable, uh, the conclusion she came uh, to. But the idea is that that was not obviously uh, Mon Monomachos because the, the face has been replaced was uh, Romano Sargiros uh, and a representative of a new elite, commercial one, uh, if you like. I don't like this label military elite because it's too, too easy one like to go to also Caldelis has, and Antonis Caldelis has worked on that, the role of the military elites, the eastern frontier. That's one way in which the, the elites of Byzantium are changing, even though the idea of military elite has been, uh, in a sense, revised. But nevertheless, his, uh, this scholar, I will tell you the name later on, uh, is basically saying, well, let's see these commercial elites, in a sense, were starting or trying to get hold of political power through Romanos Argyros and through this pouch of money, which represent is the first instance, I think, I'm not an expert in the field, but she claims that, uh, that this is a pouch of money, and money means obviously, I mean, uh, uh, commercial or the 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 the, 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 the fruits of, of commercial enterprises of of businesses. Okay, that what we're going back to the to Justinianos Particiacos I was mentioning before. Clearly, in the ninth century, in his will, is calling lab, uh, this money laboratory solidi. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, in Latin is correct, laboratory solidi, which means solidi, I mean, uh, Byzantine gold 
coins, laboratory, la, 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 laborare, right? Which may, money made out of money. And that pouch would represent something like that and a push of the elite to claim the political power of Constantinople and later on, most probably go no, went nowhere. So it's possible to see this thing. I'm not an expert by in uh, nobility, in... Uh, I have a colleague here, I'm lucky enough to have Nathalie who published, recently published a book on the uh, on the 9th and 10th centuries of mistaken elites in, uh, in the Byzantine Empire. Uh, so I'm not an expert in the field, but I think uh, the scholars I mentioned, if we bring together their work, may have a point. Uh, and this is another thing that I really like when I teach what if, right? It's counterfactual history. I love counterfactual history. And... Uh, Actually, one of my students who is uh, now PhD students who is now teaching one of those uh, courses, general introductory courses, history of civilization. Uh, she is dedicating part of her class, part of her classes, to uh, to push students into using her lectures in developing counterfactual scenarios. So uh, it's very nice. I always I liked it, and I think she had a brilliant idea in this respect. Um, uh, count what if, and this is what basically Jonathan Shea concludes in her in her thesis. What if uh, the Ottomans hadn't taken Byzantium, or the Ottomans hadn't, in a sense, uh, took over Western Anatolia, the Aegean, and so on and so forth? Maybe those cities would have developed one of Asia, Thebes, uh, uh, Ionina, and so on and so forth. Could have developed along. Uh, Italian city-state lines, the Arcontes in Kherson, the Arcontes in Monevasia being the clear, a clear example of that, the very fact that Thebes and Thebes and Kalkis, and this is the work of Nikos Kontoyanis on this, uh, worked as a kind of uh, dynamic duo. One was the arbor of the other, fun, I mean, funneling out the products of Thebes, commercial city, artisanal city, uh, and you see a lot of ceramic. This is the way you also see things, right? Going back to seeing the reality of Byzantine cities. Uh, sometimes you don't have urban fabric anymore. In Thebes, you, I think they excavated uh, tanneries, if I'm not mistaken, or uh, a couple of artisanal installation, but you don't have anything. You have the sources, the famous uh, expedition of the Normans in the 12th century, taking the silk, uh, sorry, the the silk production, those the, the, the expert in silk production to Sicily. So you see through sources, you see little in, in archaeological terms, in terms of archaeology, but you see a lot in terms of material culture, the boom in ceramic production in the Aegean, right? 12th, 13th century, uh, Ioannita Rum, um, and many others have studied this, uh, the, the, the ceramic, which basically boom in the Aegean in the 12th and 13th century. Uh, so one, another way of seeing this commercial elite booming in a sense. So what if, what if uh, Fourth Crusade first and above all the arrival of the Ottomans hadn't happened? Because the Fourth Crusade didn't disturb the provincial cities, right? That's another great uh, real issue. I mean, big deal for Constantinople, but okay, most probably a little bit of a deal for Thessaloniki, but in the rest of the empire, I mean, you have cities which basically, actually Bistra thrive because of this. So you have not a, a real disruption in the way that Constantinople was disrupted. But that's another story. So uh, I have a question that uh, has to do with the terminology that we today we talk about visiting city in general, but is there any difference uh, in, way, in the way that they called the cities, uh, Castron, Polis, and has to do with the ideology of creating one, such as Mistra and Thessaloniki, are the same in terms of ideology, and or maybe the factions that that they that they serve. Uh, well, terminology should be taken into consideration, right? Duly taken into into consideration, but uh, terminology cannot be uh, the only in indicator of the changes. I mean, we know that the Byzantine sources, we, you guys and Panos, you in particular know uh, that Byzantine sources lie. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I hate to quote 
thousand years, but it's true, everybody lies. And in particular, the Byzantine sources, so for different reasons, right? I mean, this, uh, and I think there is, Elena Saradi had done a wonderful job in uh, sifting through uh, the um, uh, geographies uh, and see how much the changes in terminology had to do with the way you want to port Byzantine saints to be portrayed. So there is a, diff a clear difference between the three periods, in a sense, she divided into three uh, periods, early, middle, and late Byzantine era. So uh, it's true, there is, uh, and then the work of John Holden, the work of Kazdan as well in his article about terminology, about Kastron, it's true, there is a certain uh, and it's in, uh, you cannot deny it, it's undeniable, that there is an, imp an important of um, military functions okay, for certain cities. Is absolutely right, thematic capital and so on and so forth. For instance, I'm simplifying here. But it's also true that certain areas of the empire militarized lay way later than others. And I'm thinking about islands, so I'm going... Uh, back to islands at some point. So this has to be taken into consideration that, for instance, uh, provinces which we tend to regard as peripheral and they were not or we tend to regard as the frontier of the empire, the military outpost of the empire, both in terms of local aristocracies and in terms of uh, urban um, profile, they didn't militarize until much, much later than Anatolia, for instance, or there are certain areas that militarize, and this is the work of Archidan uh, on the, in the Balkans, militarize a little bit earlier than others, or experience a kind of uh, retrenched urban uh, retrenchment of urban life earlier than Anatolia. So I think it's important to look at this uh, aspect instead of trying to find a one size fits all uh, model based upon terminology. Okay, and what does Castron mean? I mean, once again, Castron is more a, a way of saying as castralization, right? We are getting, we are sheltering behind, uh, behind these small walls, often built in, uh, uh, hastily built, I was saying before, sometimes actually built with which we, whichever, whatever we find, spolia, right? And I think uh, going back to this, we have to be careful there is a recent article by John Oldham which came out, which documented the stages of this pastoralization process in Anatolia. It's not true that they are built, immediately built thematic capitals. Oh, we built up the walls and everybody's behind those walls because those cities only matter. It's not true. There is a progress from strategia to themes from the 8th to the 9th century and is linking this to the urban uh, development of the singling out of certain cities as more important than others in administrative terms, but certainly not simply defined by the, the very fact that fortifications were built. And in the very case, I'm sorry, I'm going back to Ankara because I, I mean, you live in Ankara, you tend to, uh, and not far away from Amorion, by the way, which is one of the best excavated Byzantine sites, it's two hours away. So when you visited me, guys, I mean, we all go to Amorion because it's a place certainly that is worth uh, visiting. Uh, today it was used to be excavated by Eric Ivison, Martin Harrison, uh, then uh, Chris Lightfoot, then Eric Ivison, Nico Seviskis, and now it's Elia de Virago Calp in charge of the excavation. Very, They are always very welcoming. If you live in Ankara and you live in places like Amorion, yes, they are thematic capital, I can understand, but if you look in Ankara in particular at the sheer extension of what is called in Turkish today, Gavril, uh, Kale, right? Which in Turkish means castle. This is huge. This is not something that, ooh. And uh, 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 a student working on, on this, the role of Spolia here, which is uh, prominent, visually prominent, you see these walls, the these walls which encircle uh, the Byzantine, sorry, the, 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 the let's call it the, the, the former Acropolis of the city, uh, of the, sorry, of the Roman city. Well, it's a huge space. And these walls with, built with spolia, pardon, are not, and the spolia were not simple. Oh, okay, they have pragmatic functions, but they also have ideologies. Going back to the work of uh, Nikos Bakirtis, among the others on Thessaloniki and others on the walls of Thessaloniki. These, these spolia have, are meant to highlight certain parts of the city, of the citadel. 
okay? In real, and this is the, 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 the great thing, not only in relationship with what is inside the city, it's too obvious to exalt like the golden gate of Constantinople, the entrance, the main entrance to the, to the castle. Great, that's very obvious. But they are also di- in a dialogue with the, the, uh, the urban structure and the spaces which are facing those walls. Okay, in Ankara is less, a little bit less visible because I mean, they built a lot recently. So the walls are now suffocated by, but you see this in Nicaea, for instance, this is a comparison that can be done in Nicaea, another prom- uh, city prominently defined by its walls. Okay, which by the way, this time they don't even, uh, they don't even encircle a shrunk in size city, the city retained the same <laughs> dimension as the late antique city with the same orthogonal grid. And by the way, this orthogonal grid can be documented in Gorton in the 8th century, in Kherson in the 8th century, in Naples in the 8th century, in Syracuse, 8th and 9th century. So it's more common than we can think. It's not only Nicaea, but this the, the, the tower of the wall of Nicaea, which has been strengthened up with Spolia by Alexios the first uh, Homnenos, uh, use a spolia Arabic tombstone, tombstones with Arabic inscriptions, which you say, okay, whatever. Not true, because those tombstones are coming from a cemetery, I mean, which was obviously a cemetery of uh, Arabic people. Why they were there, we have no idea. I mean, were they simply prisoner war slaves. So there was a, a community like in Constantinople, there was a small, well, there was an Arabic community, an Arab, sorry, an Arabic community. Well, anyway, like in Cyprus, there was one, because Mysticus is talking about that. Anyway, uh, this reuse of spolia on that particular uh, tower uh, facing the uh, Arab cemetery is meant to signify something, is meant to create a dialogue, this time a kind of triumphal dialogue between that space of the outside of the city and that part of the wall. In Ankara, uh, Ufuk Serin has documented the same kind of thing, most probably with the church, one of the most important churches built in the in the ninth century, St. Clement's, which was the most important pilgrimage site outside the walls of Ankara, so not inside the castle. And part is, is true that it's possible that part of those, uh, of the spoiler which were used uh, in the, uh, embedded in the city walls, in that particular area of the city walls, are in dialogue with the that church. So in terms of specialities, the work of Mirto Veco has done a wonderful work in this respect with the, uh, with the mosque in Manisa has been published in the um, in the proceedings of the fourth Sevgigonu symposium. I mean, this kind of use of spolia to highlight certain parts of a building or certain parts of a wall in terms of speciality can be documented for single buildings, like a mosque. In this case, is a uh, is um, one of the Beyliks, uh, the Turkish Beyliks mosque in uh, in Manisa, if I'm not mistaken, and. Um, can be seen on on walls, and that leads us to also once again another talking about ideology. Talking, of, I mean, it leads us to to think of the role of spolia as uh, to 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 hint at the past of the city, and that is totally deliberate because in Ankara in particular, because I mean we know that the walls as the, the wall. Uh, of Ankara has been rebuilt by Michael III. There are inscriptions of him celebrating Michael III as the Ktitor, pardon, the founder. Panos, correct me if I'm wrong, and Gabriel, your, your Greek is way better than mine. Um, but your Italian is not. Um, <laughs> just joking. Um, so the, we know that the, the walls of Ankara has been at some point rebuilt after the famous, but I mean, the famous invasion, uh, incursion of the Arabs, 838, they destroyed Amorion, they dis- uh, deliberately Amorion, it was the birthplace of the dynasty, the Michael III's dynasty, the Amorian dynasty. Anyway, Amorian was destroyed in 138 Ankara as well. Michael III rebuilt both. There is an inscription on the walls of Ankara. Well, uh, a lot of spoli at that point were embedded in certain part of the of the city walls to deliberately hint at this role of refound uh, Michael III that was refounded of the ancient Anchira. Okay, the the Ankara that I mean 
uh, the Roman uh, Anchira, which law, uh, boasted the famous temple of Augustus with the rest guest uh, inscribed on, and you can still see them in what is left of the temple of Augustus, which by the way is outside once again the city was and most probably was also turned into a monastery in again the ninth century. So the relationship between the castle and what is outside, what is outside the city. So we have, in other words, to be careful when it when it when we we talk about Asti, is, that, is I think I pronounced it correctly in Greece, or or uh, Castra or uh, cities. One, I mean, when we deal with the sources, because we with literary sources, because I mean, we know that they can lie. We they know that they are using certain type of. Uh, terminology because they are the Greek, because of the, the, their models, their uh, rhetoric, and so on and so forth. Because in terms of a geography, going back to Elena Sarati work, because they want to exalt certain role of the of the saints or the importance of saint in different ways. But also when it comes to archaeology, it's not only the words that lie, but also uh, objects which can, in a sense, deceive us. And we tend to believe, of, for instance, that spolia, I, I, we put them there because we don't know, not there is a deliberate use of spolia, which has once again a superfetation, a palimpsest of meaning, which we need to take into due consideration and going back to the work before uh, among inscriptions. And there is also a certain aesthetic, I mean, involved that we certainly cannot fully grasp. I mean, those polia, that, that, and especially for Ankara, but also for Nicaea, this alternation between certain, col I mean, white marbles and uh, ashlar blocks. I mean, it creates a certain, I mean, there is an, an, an intent to um, to make certainly the walls less monotonous or less dull uh, in, in the same way as later on in the 11th and 12th century, right? They decorated uh, with bricks, they built the the the, the the walls of ecclesiastical buildings, I'm thinking of Daphne and others with these beautiful patterns, brick patterns, and so on and so forth. You know this thing better than me. So there is a, a, a lot that uh, more than it meets the eyes, it meets meet the eyes. That's, I think that's the right word. So terminology, I think, should be weaved into all this sort of thing. And this is interdisciplinary. I think you both guys are mastering this interdisciplinarity way better than me. And I think just to build up a bit, and I think uh, at least the inscriptions and the, um, the study of uh, epigraphy, even though it's still and very sadly in our field is still quite embryotic, has to add much in, uh, at least in the terminology. We have great studies from, uh, you know, Azdraka, uh, Sofia Kalopisi Verti, and more, and even uh, master thesis uh, in Greece, also doctoral thesis. That has to add much in, in this discussion and hopefully in the future we'll see more. No, it's, it's true. And, and I think uh, Ida thought, Ida, which who published a handbook of Byzantine epigraphy. Um, so that kind of, of work uh, on epigraphy, as you were saying, could be zoom out in a sense from the inscription and so on and so forth and related to uh, to cities and the roles of wall the role of walls pardon has uh, blackboards that's what Nikos Bakir this is mentioning his work on Thessaloniki literally black uh, blackboards of the life of what was going on in the city not simply in terms of ah, okay they refounded or they decided to rebuild or sponsor the rebuilding of a certain structure of the world, but simply as going back to aristocracies, telling us what was going, what aristocracies thought or what aristocracies were doing in the city, the kind of messages that they want to, uh, to, uh, to, to pass and to pound, uh, in a sense, upon... The local people. I mean, the, the, certain, the position of certain inscription is strategic. It's not simply ah, we put him there because not the certain. And in Thessaloniki, you have them right in the passage from the um, from the um, uh, lower city to the to the to the to the citadel to the Anopoli. Uh, the Anopoli. Thanks. Certain inscriptions are strategically positioned to uh, 
to be seen and to pass a certain type of message or in a sense to let the, I mean to let the people know about the importance of center certain members of the aristocracy local aristocracy who had uh, a certain type of agenda mostly imperial obviously in places like Thessaloniki and or Ankara where you have this kind of inscription literally you cannot miss it because you bump into it before entering the the bent gate which gave an entrance to the to the inner castle i mean it's there you cannot miss it it's super it's super uh it's super visible so it's it's meant to be seen when you enter in this case it's obviously the emperor telling certain things but in thessaloniki you have this kind of local aristocracy also playing or again sorry or competing against uh each other so i i, I fully i fully agree this idea of getting the epigraphy more into the picture in this respect. To complete what you were saying, there is also, and you are absolutely right in terms of, there is also a visuality, pardon, of city walls that with San Demetrius is pretty obvious in Crete, right? And with the mosaic with, I mean, the background is the walls, right? The famous mosaic with the San Demetrius embracing the, yes. uh, the archbishop, the city walls and this apotropaic role of walls because they are the cross, I mean, being put, uh, there and even this is something that again I mean, I'm working a lot with Nikos Bakirtis, who is a friend and also a, a great scholar, and he taught me a lot. Uh, he also um, identified the use of certain, and I've I've seen this in Ankara. He didn't. He, he, teor, he, uh, he was referring to places like. Ceres and like Thessaloniki indeed, but I found it in Ankara, is the way that they reuse uh, Roman or part of Roman statues or Roman engravings with a, 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 a full uh, or a half a bust in a sense figure and they put it in the wall to, I mean, on top of the, I mean, far away from the, from the viewer, so very high, I mean, uh, on the on the on the facade of those walls to act as icons. That's extremely fascinating. I mean, extremely in the same way as San Dimitrios is there with the walls. You have those spolia acting as icons uh, to protect so apotropaic. Not only the cross, which is pretty obvious, but also icons. So there is also this aspect of the apotropaic function, the sanctification of the city of the Pomerium, right of the city, which has always been holy from the time of Romulus when he. He, he, he plucked the the first the, the, the sacred pomerium was called right the the, the, the incent. Sorry, Thomas, you were saying. Yes, I think that in order to uh, understand the creation or the to how the city as city evolves through the time, all the changes that happen socially from uh, too many threads are, that uh, include uh, that are in the region, such as Thessaloniki and Macedonia. Uh, or even uh, in uh, Turkey, Istanbul, and uh, etc. We have to to take uh, to to have in mind all these factors that make a city live, evolve, and protect also the the society and the the city itself from any threat of the region and. To help our listeners to understand the the visiting city in general. I think that uh, we have talked about uh, Castron, Thessaloniki, Constantinople, Crete, and many other places, but uh, we don't, uh, we haven't spoken about the islands or the difference between islands and um, cities like Thessaloniki and Constantinople. Is there any difference in these cities, islands and mainland? Certainly, there is a difference in terms of. I don't like to use this word, and I'm using it with a 3,600 pinch of salt, like the, the Turkish guy that put the salt there. Okay, South Bay, whatever it's called. And um, continuity. Okay, there is a lot, but not for the sake of it, but simply because I was mentioning before, and this is the work of uh, Cosentino as well as proved that uh, islands, large islands, here we have to. First and foremost, to which islands? Because not every island is is an island. Yes, it is. But I mean, I'm talking about large islands. Obviously, 
there is a theorization in insular studies now that separates archipelagi from islands. So there is this kind of uh, theorization is uh, people like Baldacchino have done it, not to do with Byzantine studies, but with insular studies, um, which theorize the difference between large islands and archipelagos. But that's a completely different. So the Aegean, you can regard them as a bunch of archipelagos, whereas we are talking about big islands, then, I mean, uh, size matters, and I'm not saying anything that Gavril does not know um, about. Uh, so I'm talking about Cyprus, I'm talking about Rhodes, I'm talking about Crete, I'm talking, even if Rhodes also is, is a little bit debatable, that's for the sake of it, I'm talking about um, Crete, I'm talking about Sicily, I'm talking about Malta, I'm talking about Sardinia, and I'm talking about the Balearics. So it's a corridor, in a sense. That's how it has been described. Now, a corridor island by Salvatore Cosentino. Now, the problem with these islands is that uh, they are being regarded... When I start working on islands, because I was in Cyprus, what else can you possibly do if not work on islands? I was Cyprus back then. And then I started expanding my... broadening my horizon to other islands. Um, the first thing that... Uh, you, they were seen, they were regarded as big islands as peripheral. I mean, maybe Crete was an exception because more, more or less part of the Aegean, but certainly peripheral, okay? Military outpost at the frontier, whatever the frontier meant, and so on and so forth, okay? To the point that certain islands were not even regarded as part of the Byzantine Empire. Crete and uh, Cyprus, certainly, yes. Lost, one lost in the, sort of lost, in the second half of the... 7th century until 965, Crete lost for 150 years, more or less. And that's it. That's the attention that the islands got, but both regarded as frontier, uh, military outpost. Uh, the word of Lungis, for instance, is in this respect very relevant. Malamut as well, Elizabeth Malamut. Then Sicily was included much more into the picture. Partially because, I mean, we realized the importance that he had as the granary of the empire after Egypt fell, and partially because archaeology came much more into the picture. So from the Eastern Mediterranean, we slowly acknowledged that Sicily was an important uh, part of the Byzantine Empire. But still, I mean, at the best you can offer, like you and Morrison were doing that, uh, attach it to the Byzantine Earthland, like um, Chris Wickham defined Aegean and Anatolia uh, in his framing the early Middle Ages. So, and that's it, in a sense. Then Sicily was lost. 878 Syracuse, the, the capital, fell. That's it, finish. Okay, very easy. Uh, very easy, easy piece, that's the way. But I mean, it's not this that was not the case. And what we have realized that those islands, that corridor, as is uh, Cosentino defined it, retain economic, much more economic with vitality than the Earthland until, well, in the ninth century. It was a less militarized place, with the exception, partial exception of Sicily, but the other islands, for instance, Sicily became a theme. The other islands never became a theme, going back to the Archontate that we were mentioning. Whatever Archontate or Ducate meant, certainly they were not military. There is not a development of a military aristocracy in the way that you see, for instance, in Constantinople and in Anatolia in the, in the 7th or 8th century. There is not this kind of militarization. And there is a deliberate attempt of the Byzantine Empire not only to retain those islands, but to link those islands, and that was the third step, in a sense, because it would be easy then to, uh, historiographically, to say, ah, well, then, and they did, and it has been done at, up to a point, but Enrico Zanini, Philippe Pergola, and Dimitris Michaelidis, when they edited this book called The Insular System of Byzantium, to say, well, okay, then let's in englobate this corridor into another big chunk, okay, of a, th a third pillar, in a sense, of the Byzantine Empire, Anatolia, Aegean, and the islands. That's it. All the islands are the same. Not true. Not even that is, is true. And um, islands developed in, in a different ways. So what happened in Sardinia, in, uh, in, ba in Balearics, in Malta, 
uh, is obviously different than what's going on in Sicily and Crete, but let's let's forget that other because we were talking about cities. Well, anyway, the very fact that it is an attempt to, on the part of the Byzantine Empire, to weave, to weave this insular world into a, a, a kind of what has been described by Paul Arthur, among the others, as Byzantine kine, as a um, collection of coastal and insular spaces, which uh, boasted gateway communities, uh, herb, arbors, or real cities. I mean, real, much more prominent urban uh, sites. I mean, I'm not so important. So a kind of a hierarchy of settlement, which we can see in action and linked together by a material culture. Because this is the point. We see a deliberate attempt of the state through material culture. I'm going to talk about ovodile amphora, global amphora, global amphora, seals, coins, and so on and so forth. A deliberate attempt on the part of the uh, of the Constantinople to keep those uh, insular and coastal spaces, this kine, together. And the material culture is the best way of seeing that. Well, this has allowed us to see how urban life in those on those islands because of this kind of economic vitality, less militarization and so on and so forth, developed not necessarily along the lines that we experience, for instance, in Anatolia or elsewhere. So place like Gorty, for instance, places which is one of the best excavated uh, and places like uh, Catania, Syracuse, Palermo, Cagliari, uh, Olbia. Olbia is a great example, for instance, is on the eastern, northeastern coast of Sardinia, and it was an important harbor for in the Roman period. Then we thought, well, the Visigoth came, goodbye, the, the thing is over, the, the, not the Visigoth, the, the, the Vandal, Vandals came, and it was game over for, uh, for, um, for that harbor. It's not true. They managed to find, through an analysis of shipwrecks, we realized that that harbor remained much, much more frequented until, sorry, very frequented until later. I mean, so part of this Byzantine Q&A, places like, uh, not on islands, but places like Butrint, for instance, places like Zadar uh, in Croatia, places like Venice, uh, Rialto. Okay, so uh, Comacchio, this is another ex fantastic example of uh, how, uh, I, I was mentioning before, uh, Comacchio is not far away, north of Ravenna, okay, and it's uh, an emporium. I was saying that before. It's an emporium, and it's a real, uh, actually, a, a real example of new city, completely uh, not not built from a previous existing settlements. Eight and ninth century, built. I mean, developing along the lines of emporia, so purely commercial, purely commercial, living, thriving, and prospering on uh, this kind of. Uh, brokerage between the uh, connecting part, uh, the uh, Byzantine network, economic uh, network with the Carolingian network. Um, so you see cities like that and you don't see Comacchio anywhere else. Okay, in It's not fully a Byzantine city, but it has a certain, uh, I mean, it's, it's political uh, life and uh, is social life and the aristocracy certainly look also at Byzantium. Material culture is definitely Byzantine or at least partially Byzantine. Uh, so uh, you see these kind of trends that you don't see elsewhere and it's not by chance that that street grid which was, yes, it's that we saw we saw in Nicaea, we can document in Nicaea, we can find that street grid being retained in cities like Kherson, which was part of that Quine, Syracuse, which was part of that Quine on an island, Kherson coast of Syracuse on an island, okay, Gortin, which was uh, on the capital of Crete, Salamis, Constantia, the capital of Cyprus, where they, I mean, obviously, Cyprus is a big deal. We cannot, there has not been excavation uh, taking place in uh, the northern 
half of the island since 1972. But you, you can see that the street grid, the orthogonal street grid in Salamis was uh, respected, in particular the Decumanos leading to, to the harbor, which remained frequented in the 8th century. So also there you have the street grid in, uh, in place. And you have once again this dialogue between the walled area and in this very case, the harbor. So this is the reason, sorry, Panos, for the long uh, answer, but this is the reason why certain trends uh, being highly innovative, uh, like Comacchio up to a point, Kivitas Nova Lacliana, or simply uh, much showing much more continuity with the, in terms of palimpsest once again, with the uh, with, um, late antique uh, cities can be visible on islands because islands develop in in a or follow certain trajectories politically economically uh, in terms in military terms well into the ninth century uh, and retain much more vitality in each one of these uh, of these uh, aspects if you want uh, and urban is is in a certain way reflecting right what's going on uh, in uh, on uh, in the region at large and this is why you can maybe see it uh, see it a little bit uh, a little bit better then once again i was telling before crete uh, changed the settlement pattern already cyprus is a big question mark i mean with nikos bakistis we even theorized at some point that for a while it was a um, an, an island with no capital okay with some is constant retain certain function of a capital but the other functions were in a sense uh, moved elsewhere and scattered a bit along the northern coast uh, so it's uh, interest i mean interesting to see this sort of in continuity vitality resilience that's the word better to use rather than continuity resilience which lasted into the ninth century and could be reflected into urbanism then gabriel can tell me well but this is and what after the ninth century well, Gabriel is absolutely right, as often happens, uh, that uh, you see the certain trends, which actually the trends you can document in Anatolia and elsewhere with this kind of walls being built, uh, new ways of devising cities in much more uh, with the, the, the military function of the protective function, much more uh, giving the, uh, being given the private place being implemented in particular in Sicily as well uh, with the creation of uh, proper at least in these fortresses I'm thinking about Ragusa I'm thinking about Enna I'm thinking about Butera with, to protect the main capital which was uh, or actually to protect the urban settlement on the east coast in particular Syracuse the capital uh, so you see and much and in the development of an internal frontier that's obviously what happened in Sicily because of the Aglabid invasion but you see these trends but to go back to this point you see certain trends developing because islands as uh, were much more resilient spaces as part of this coine uh, well into the ninth the ninth century thank you very much Luca for that and uh, we don't have much time left but I have to say now for our listeners that if they enjoy the conversation and they want to learn more most of the things we talked about have been published by you first of all in your big volume uh, which you publish uh, in 2021 if I'm not wrong the Byzantine city from Heraclius to the fourth crusade 610 to 1204 published by uh, Palgrave Macmillan And very rec- the, your very recent uh, article in the DO, the Bartolong Papers, uh, A Lost World That Never Died. Now, I would like to ask you, because I know you've told us, of course, um, I, don't, I don't have like secret uh, undisclosed information. Uh, I would like to ask you, what's next for you? Uh, uh, my next project is, actually, one is, has been recently completed. The manuscript has been finally delivered to Routledge uh, is a book that has been commissioned to Nikos Bakirtis and myself is the Routledge Companion to Byzantine Cities is coming out in uh, by the end of the year that's what Routledge at least said um, it should be at least in the electronic version so that's job done but the next big uh, project which is basically the, the conclusion of this long journey which started in 
2008, in when I set foot on uh, 2008, yes, September, when I set foot on uh, Cyprus, is um, a book which is under contract with IRC, um, a book on Byzantine, large Byzantine uh, islands, which if everything goes fine, uh, it will be published, it will complete in 2024 and most probably coming out in 2025, if not by the end of 2024. So that's how the two, I mean, a project which has been, which has recently come to an end. And I have to say it was very, very nice project because I mean, one of the things that I like is to, when I have the opportunity to work in a team and to work with people I regard first as friends and then as great colleagues and great source of inspirations. So inspiration. So in, in the edited volume, there are 20 contributors. I was lucky enough to have people I really uh, admire, whose work I really admire and were a very good friend from, from Mirto Veiku to, to Maria Cristina Carile, to Enrico Civelli, to Elisabetta Giorgi, uh, and um, and and many many others. Jan Randall uh, who is a great expert on material culture on, on the maritime frontier. Uh, so I, I, I'm forgetting uh, Elena Saradi as well. So and um, and uh, Michael Dacre among the others. So those all are great scholars, fantastic scholars, but also good friends. And it was enormous fun. And I learned a lot, and it was great to have have them as part of this uh, of this project. So this is a kind of something that I would like to to do again, maybe in the future, in a different format. My one thing that I like to do, I mean, under the auspices of this uh, once again joint effort with uh, local with colleagues from uh, from Ankara, um, in particular. Sir Jan Yandem, uh, who teaches at the JTP, has always been of huge uh, help and support. It's called Byzantium at Ankara. We have a website on this and we uh, we organize uh, online, mostly, unfortunately, uh, conferences or seminars, workshops or seminars. Well, under the auspice of Byzantine, of Byzantium and Ankara, we had a war recently a workshop in which called it Zooming in Byzantine Cities, in which we put we brought scholars working on cities on different aspects of urbanism in the interdisciplinary perspective in a dialogue with uh, with one another. And it was a great, uh, great fun because all of them mostly know each other or each other work. So I would love to do something and publish something along those lines because I think working together with great scholars and friends, as you said, brings up all the passion, all the ideas uh, and it's, it's huge fun and is usually benefit and it's not the same, the usual format, right? And you are invited, obviously both panels are already invited, but Gabriel, you are both most welcome to virtually come to give us talks to students and to the enthusiasts, local enthusiasts and to the scholars indeed, here. Indeed. So we have to work on this. Uh, we should. Thanks a lot, Luca, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. We really appreciate it that you accepted our invitation and you came uh, to our podcast. You know, we tried actually. You know, we tried many times to actually arrange this recording. Uh, we finally made it, and uh, we're glad. Um, especially after our meeting, you know, in uh, Birmingham when we first met. Oh, thank you, guys. I think I mean when we met in Birmingham. Sorry, then I'll, I'll, it was it's a fantastic thing that you are doing. Big fan. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. We're looking forward to reading your uh, next work. We wish you all the best. Thanks a lot, Luca. Same to you guys. Ευχαριστούμε το ιστολόγιο Ανασκαφή για την αναδημοσίευση των επεισοδίων μας.